Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are really excited to have this panel today um, and we'll be sharing different insights on community-centered approaches to public health challenges. We'll give just another minute to get started um, about two after. All right, I'm going to get us started. I see folks still joining in, um, but I want to welcome everyone. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today for this very important session um, of Global Health Corps' Shift Happens series. Um, today, we will be talking about community-centered approaches to public health challenges. Uh, I am Hannah Taylor. I am Global Health Corps' Senior Director of Community Impact. And I am so excited to be here with our exceptional panelists and our moderator. So with a shortage of over 7.2 million healthcare workers worldwide, the global health system lacks the human power necessary to optimally treat the world's population. And this is really particularly felt in the communities who are often facing long travel times, and poor access to formal health facilities, which means a strong community level health support system really increases our access to care and can be critical to improving health outcomes for the population. And this makes community health interventions an essential part of our health systems globally. And the work that all of these panelists are doing and what is critical to Global Health Corps' mission of really having strong health systems. So I'm excited for this discussion um, on these community health approaches, uh, community-centered approaches to public health. Um, and what we can understand from these panelists, their work and experiences on solutions um, to these challenges um, ways that they have navigated to find success in really bringing community-based approaches. So I will briefly introduce our uh, moderator today who will then be introducing our panelists. So I'm delighted to have Stephen Mickey here with us. He is a 2022-2023 Global Health Corps Fellow, um, was placed in Zambia as a community health specialist. He is a public health care professional with extensive experience in community-based health. Currently, he serves as a project officer with On Call Africa for two projects with community-based volunteers and the VITAL project. He has been working in program development and implementation for the last several years with previous roles um, as the community health specialist, where he coordinated health programs and strengthened partnerships as well as with digital monitoring and tracking specialists, a uh, specialization on HIV AIDS program. So Stephen will be introducing our panelists for today's discussion. Um, I hope everyone on the line will also share your insights, your comments, your questions in the chat box, uh, in the Q and A, uh, and we will have time at the end to be able to answer those questions um, with our panelists. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Yambo. Um, and thank you so much, Stephen, for moderating this discussion. So I will pass it over to you, Stephen. All right. Thank you so much, Hannah. I appreciate the introduction. And I'll go straight away and introduce our two our panelists. That's uh, Yombo as well as Claire. So starting with Yombo, just a bit of some background on Yombo. So he's originally from Burkina Faso, and he started his career as an educator and a training program coordinator. And over the past 25 years, Yombo has worked with health ministries, international organizations, and local organizations, both in Africa and in the United States of America. 
and he was providing uh, technical guidance on primary health care system strengthening with particular focus on uh, and particular okay, focus and interest in uh, community health system capacity. And uh, he worked at Columbia University's F uh, Institute where he directed operations in health and provided technical guidance on health systems designs, implementation, and management, and providing policy review in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he later, of course, joined the International Rescue Committee to lead the Child Health Unit to develop the organizational community uh, health system, as well as the technical capacity, both at the headquarters as well as in the field. Now, since 2017, Yombo has served as a senior technical Director of Programs at Team MB and leading a technical team at the headquarters and in the country office in the conceptualization, the design, the development and the implementation and the data-driven quality of the health programs globally. And now that is the huge kind of experience for Yombo and it would be good that he will be able to share some of that experience with us. Now going on, moving on to player, one of the uh, uh, alums now. So player was a fellow in the year 2011 to 2012, and he was placed in Burundi as a program uh, a project manager at village, uh, village Health Works, and he worked in the community health at local health department in New in the UK. Uh, in, U um, in the United States, and that is in New York City. And during the height of the COVID pandemic for two years, uh, uh, and before that, she spent her 10 years leading uh, public health programs in water sanitation and governance in East Africa, and was based, of course, in Burundi and then in the DRC. And now she has experience with maternal health, uh, uh, maternal and child health programs, and the development of drinking water systems. And she completed her master's of public health at Columbia University and spent her last four years as a program coordinator, both uh, under postgraduate. And now player has took a sabbatical year, of course, just to rest in 2023 uh, to travel and write, which is very important. And she is now consulting and advising the health uh, in the field of public health and public uh, service uh, governance. Now, without further ado there, uh, uh, driving through in our discussion today, we have uh, our subject on uh, uh, community-based uh, interventions. Now, under community-based interventions and programs, these initiatives, of course, they aim to improve uh, health and well-being of specific populations and groups with a divine local community. So that is uh, important to note. And these interventions are often uh, multi-component, and meaning that they employ multiple strategies as well as tactics to achieve their goals. They may include individual-driven strategies or level, and such as education as well as counseling or as well as environmental level strategies, such as policy changes and community mobilization. And now to have our panelists share a bit on this, uh, let's go to each of uh, uh, our two panelists, as Robo, uh, as well as Claire, to give us an insight on what they understand uh, around, or to give us a, a, a brief background of their work around community-centered approach to public health. I'll start with Yombo on that. Do you have Yombo there? Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, yes, so CMMB, Catholic Medical Mission Board, uh, that I work for is a faith-based organization that works in three major areas. So one is delivering healthcare that is focused on women and children. So 
maternal, newborn, and child health, or MNCH, if you will. And distributing donated medicine and medical supplies. So that's medical donation program. That's the second area. And the third area is deploying volunteers, it's something that you know Global Health Court also does uh, to some of the most remote regions of the world. So CMMB's vision is a world in which every human life is valued and health and human dignity are shared by all. And because of our commitment to dignity and sustainability, we locally uh, execute our MNCH programs known under its signature name as CHAMPS, which is Children and Mothers Partnerships. Um, and we locally execute them in five countries, Haiti, Kenya, Peru, South Sudan, and Zambia. We rely on country nationals who represent and are well reg regarded by the communities we serve. So our MNCH technical approach is chess. What does it mean? It's community health system strengthening. Uh, the number of communities supported is one of our KPIs, which is key program indicators. Chess is community centered. It is community led. It entails the use of data to prioritize and strategize the ways in which we facilitate health at home and health at facilities such that we can galvanize communities in leading the uptake of integrated health for the long term. It is grounded in three uh, essential values. Our belief that people do want to be healthy and when they're not healthy, they want to get better. It is grounded in our trust in the communities that we serve, that they may be vulnerable, they have assets and resources without which nothing impactful or durable can be achieved in them. And in our firm conviction that only through their trust, their ownership and their leadership can our programs be delivered with dignity and sustainability. With that grounding, our CHAMPS program then worked to strengthen the community health systems by putting community back in them uh, and drawing from four decades of global evidence and experience. And then we improve the capacity of health facilities to provide accessible and quality services by functionalizing those facilities across the six uh, system blocks, the health system blocks. And by building up the ME system capacity for data generation and use. So because of that, uh, we are seeing impact. For example, in Haiti, 88% of children in our CHAMPS uh, in, uh, catchment are fully vaccinated. And if you compare that to the 41% nationwide. In Zambia, stronger community uh, health committees, those leaders for community health systems, they're now advocating for improved healthcare infrastructure in the programs that we are. The government of Zambia has even taken up the cost of an effective CSW supervision model that we piloted as part of our work. In Kenya, a county government has taken up and expanded our community health system strengthening model. And last but not least, as I know Claire is gonna to touch on it, during COVID, we all remember the need to reach, commun uh, reach communities and our community health workers proved to be the first and best pillar in the response framework during that pandemic. I'll stop here. Right, thank you so much Omar, for that. That is very insightful. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the approach that CMMB is using in terms of the chess, uh, the community health systems, I think that's an important approach. Uh, over time, I think from what I'm thinking is that you really do empower communities to take responsibilities of their health, which is very important because then that will be more sustainable as they uh, take part in achieving their well-being in terms of health. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to you, Claire. Uh, uh, you can share your insights as well. I, I know you've worked as a, a COVID-19 uh, prevention, uh, that approach as well. 
and you have amazing experience there. So I'd love to get your insight as well over that. Over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Yambo. Uh, pleasure to be here today. And um, so I'll speak with um, today just about uh, my most recent experience with the community-centered approach um, that was working at the local health department in Tompkins County, New York. So not the city, but about three hours west of the city. And we were focused on COVID-19 prevention and response. So our community in there is about 100,000 people. And most of that population is living in the city, but there's also a significant rural population too. There's a significant number of people, about 16% of the population living below the poverty level and about 25% are non-white. So I was community health director and um, in that role, I was leading the COVID prevention and response team. So we had a fleet of community health nurses who were responsible for case management and contact tracing. And we followed uh, the guidelines according to New York State and uh, CDC protocol. Um, for every single case in the county, within 24 hours of receiving the positive test result, our, our role was to, uh, to reach those individuals. Um, so our team supported them to isolate safely at home when infectious by calling them every day, providing them with documentation for important benefits, um, providing social psychosocial support. Many people were um, struggling uh, to, to understand what was going on and, um, and our nurses were able to address some of those challenges uh, over the phone. Uh, there was a lot of logistical problem solving and uh, clinical support as well to help monitor and track symptoms and flag warning signs to be able to encourage people to seek uh, care at a hospital when, when they needed. Um, so as I mentioned, we interpreted the guidelines that were available at the state and federal level. We were at the local level, the county level, and we developed our own local policies. Um, we would advise businesses on how to mitigate the spread, masking, distancing, contact tracing, and how to support their own staff um, who might have been exposed or sick. And when the vaccine became available, we also led mass vaccination efforts um, and, and brought the vaccine um, out into the community. All this, done, all this work was done um, in concert with community organizations and leaders. So as the public health department, we had a mandate to ensure the coordination um, and, and management of the response but we could not have done it alone. We depended on these other organizations in order to facilitate the response efforts, to tailor our messages and support the specific needs of subgroups within the population. We coordinated with schools, with daycares, with nursing homes, with assisted living and hospitals, homeless shelters, community centers, and we would address um, and prioritize the most vulnerable populations when an outbreak occurred. We also coordinated with food banks, with pharmacies, with hospitals, with labs, with doctor's offices, with taxi companies, libraries, churches, hotels, businesses to provide people with the necessary resources and information to quarantine and isolate safely and minimize disruption to critical social and economic services. We helped people address the social determinants of health that they struggled with in quarantine or isolation, sometimes food, sometimes finding shelter or a safe place to isolate. Sometimes it was transportation. Um, sometimes mental health needs were, uh, were required. Um, and 
in order to safely isolate and quarantine, those needs had to be addressed. It required tremendous coordination and communication at multiple levels within our county. We could not have done it alone, and it required trust between the community and the government for people and organizations to follow our guidelines, many of which were unpopular among different subgroups at different times. While we had the authority and the legal power to enforce these policies and coerce desired health behaviors, we knew that using force or involving the criminal justice system would not lead to better public health response or outcomes. We depended on individuals having good information in a dynamic crisis and acting responsibly and in the shared interests of the entire community. We depended on the existence of a social contract between community members themselves. We required people's trust in the institutions leading them and in our decision-making processes. And the community is at the center of the approach because that's the most effective and efficient way to fight a pandemic. Thank you. All right, Thea, thank you so much. That's some um, great clips and amazing work that you've done. Uh, similarly as well, I think I can pick some few points that uh, approach my work experience as well, like working with the community to empower them as well as to support their needs. And also, maybe also to applaud your team. I you know COVID time, it was risky for health workers and for everyone else. And they put themselves on the line to make sure that they reach out to communities to assist them. And that was amazing. And thank you so much for sharing. And now, uh, community uh, uh it's an approach that is now being more recognized by international uh, organization and the international community. And in many countries, the intervention themselves to strengthen this component of our community remains uh, insufficient in terms of the approach itself, in terms of it being acknowledged, prioritized, as well as integrated in the, the national plans and the budgets. So what are some of the challenges that you think this community-centered approach is facing right now in order in, in the attempts to address our public health challenges. And um, we'll start with you, Claire. Okay, thank you. There are so many challenges, um, some not unique to community health approaches, but one that I encountered in with the pandemic, um, many people encountered was constant and abrupt changes in context. And the challenge that we had was the inability for the system to adapt in time. So we were less effective at slowing the spread than we could have been. Communication with government within the government and between organizations was often slow, bureaucratic, very top down. For example, we were frequently in this awkward position of waiting for the state to develop a solution that we at the county level knew we needed to implement for weeks before it was officially adopted. And we'd lose credibility among the population and add confusion with all the delays. Or we wanted to collaborate with Cornell University, which has a significant population in the town that I worked in. And they would help with contact tracing for students so we could prioritize our resources at the health department on the most vulnerable community members and reduce duplication of work among our teams. But there were a lot of bureaucratic hurdles to information sharing that we had to navigate. For another example, we might have a priority in our county and resources to address it, but the funds were restricted to something that was less important or irrelevant in our county. So the challenge was we needed more flexibility and autonomy at the local level to develop solutions for the local context. That was one big challenge. Another one uh, that we encountered, the second challenge was related to trust. So sometimes the public did not trust us, the community health providers. Sometimes they didn't trust each other. From historical abuses like the Tuskegee experiment to politicization of public health messaging by opportunistic leaders in both political parties, 
to misinformation spread by social media, people were often not sure exactly what or who to believe. I saw this in New York with COVID as I saw it in Ebola, uh, with Ebola in the DRC. The pandemic accentuated divides among society. It brought to light, uh, and in some cases it amplified social tensions that were already there, and it extended the crisis period of the pandemic longer than it needed to be. Communication was clear, was key to earning trust, and we were not always able to do that very well. We struggled to get clear and reliable information to people at the right time and through the right channels. And we struggled to receive their feedback, to learn from them what they needed to hear and what they wanted. Um, and if I may, if I could say a third, do we have time? Yes, the quick one. Yes, you can run through a quick one last time. <laughs> third, last challenge. Uh, public right. health infrastructure in the United States was underfunded and understaffed for years, and that led to burnout quickly in the pandemic. I think many people are familiar with that. Nurses, for example, during the pandemic were high in high, very high demand and in short supply, and that made it very difficult to staff the response efforts. Job conditions were tough, the risks were high, and the pay was low. We were in a constant state of recruitment and orientation. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Let you come both right. share some challenge. All right. Thank you so much, Claire. I will get back to you. Uh, yes, so do you have any any any, any challenges that you think uh, are being faced by this uh, community-centered approach in addressing uh, the aspect of public health uh, issues? I mean, I think Claire really uh, hit on uh, the, the 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 most important ones. I, I and I feel like what I'm going to say, some to some extent, is you know offshoots of, of that. I, I I wanted to add uh, in the as a social service, uh, public health depends on donors, especially in uh, you know places that we work, CMB. And the donor mindset needs to change. I think many, many donors still expect community-centered interventions to produce uh, tangible results. Uh, and so that really pushes uh, designers of community-centered approaches to look for quick wins so that they can report back and say, we have, you know, we promise to do this, we have done it. And so that has a ripple effect on really truly bu building uh, trust that Claire was referring to. Without trust, you can't really uh, get to into a community. I mean, take for some of us who have kids here, if you don't have your child's trust, you can't communicate with them. You cannot understand them. And if you don't understand someone, you cannot support them. It's just that simple. You don't talk a community into trusting you. It takes a time. And uh, unfortunately, community-centered approaches are not supported, they're not funded with the unlimited time that sometimes you know, these processes need to take. Uh, the other one that I will add is really the fluidity of situations. I mean, uh, if you take a situation like Haiti, we work in Haiti, we can't control the broader context. Uh, in our, uh, we work in Southern Haiti, and luckily it's outside of Port-au-Prince, it's far from the gang area, but the broader context is still affects how much flexibility or mobility we can and cannot do. So you have to really, you know, this is not something that you can design, you can work into your, uh, your, uh, your model. That's all I would add. Thank you so much, Shombo, I think that was great. Um... And, and when you look at the uh, community-centered approach itself, it really involves uh, us actively engaging and empowering these communities to address and solve uh, these health uh, challenges in a collaborative way. So this is very important for, uh, for us to achieve health equity. Now, when you look at the challenges that you have mentioned, the aspect of trust, and lack of funding, and also there is a part of communication, and to some extent also there is an aspect of political will that has to play its role there. And 
could also be another challenge. Uh, what do you think uh, should be done or is being done to address uh, these challenges that are being faced by this community that uh, approach of information to public health? And uh, we'll start with you, Claire, so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. So one great solution, I think Global Health Corps fits in this um, category as well. Um, to the, It's a solution to the staffing issue and the human resources issue is building the next generation of public health leaders. So um, in the health department, uh, they began during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, a new public health fellowship program, the New York State Public Health fellows. Um, and they're wonderful positions for people to understand uh, what, what the work is about, um, and then develop and foster their, their interests and their experience and give back to the, um, to the community at a time when it's, it's really critical. And then they're ready to deal with the next crisis when it comes. Um, Another solution um, along the lines of, of staffing and trust building and, um, and ensuring that our, our solutions are most relevant is um, community health workers. These uh, programs are relatively new in the United States, um, but they're growing in popularity. Uh, these are trained paid professionals from the communities served. Uh, often people have uh, lived experience dealing with the health issues that are facing the community. Uh, so we might promote that kind of um, that, that experience over other criteria such as uh, advanced degrees. It's a different kind of expertise that's really that's really valuable. Um, and these programs, community health worker programs help to address social determinants of health. They connect people to all the, the many services uh, that, that comprise uh, a health system. Um, they promote importantly two-way communication with community members. So they're listening to community members and they're also sharing information back. Um, and, and I think as Yangwo mentioned, reducing the communication barriers and gaps is really critical um, to, to building trust. Uh, so the community health workers is a way of um, kind of ensuring that solutions are for the community and by the community. Um, another example uh, solutions that uh, I've seen is through the, the pandemic, an increase in collaboration between health departments um, and also between companies and community organizations to exchange ideas, best practices. I think the public health department collaborated in a way that had never before been seen with the hospital. They needed to do that in order to roll out the vaccine, in order to ensure that um, the patients in the hospital were, were safe uh, and, and that COVID was mitigated. Um, and so that that kind of um, experience, I think, has a lasting impact, and we've seen what can be done uh, in the future um, from that from that example. Um, I think I would say some things that should be done um, include an increase in investment in local public health leadership, an increase in autonomy and flexibility in spending. I think Yombo mentioned. Um, the need for um, uh, flexibility and uh, length of time to kind of um, to do the work that takes um, takes a, a long time to unfold. Um, and so we need uh, funding that um, that has longer periods, uh, five, ten years of funding. Um, and another I would say that should be done, which this webinar is a part of, is that we should take time to document and share and learn from these lessons. So one of the challenges with public health and prevention is that sometimes it's invisible. It's hard to quantify and it's hard to advocate for it. So thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, Yoko, do you have anything uh, to add on how best uh, or what should be done to address these challenges? Right. 
Yes, uh, sure. I, I, I think uh, I am going to leave uh, the, uh, the, the donor side, which Claire has touched on, uh, because I think we do need uh, donor education and uh, a donor mindset. Actually, right now, if you all know the organization called Chic Community Health Impact Coalition, one of their pillars is to really change that mindset. Uh, they have a lot of advocacy uh, to major donors like USG, USAID, uh, PEPFAR, to try to work and address some of the verticalities or just short-term short, short outcome-seeking uh, funding. So uh, what I would really want to, to stress on is trust and commitment. Um, because it does, it does take trust to be able to go past the problems that we think communities have, especially when you are sitting from the from the global north and trying to affect uh, and, and impact global south. I think it it takes it takes a lot to understand the real problem. Sometimes we we think that communities have certain problems when they're just our perceptions. And it's only with trust that you can understand those. And one of the, re one of the ways that we are, we are kind of trying to address that issue at CMMB is really to uh, stay, live with them and let them lead in identifying the gaps. We call it gap analysis, but really behind or inside that term is learning through their eyes, learning through their voices and learning through their, uh, their realities. Uh, and I think the second one, which is commitment, these issues, public health issues are not issues that you can change with a magic wand. These are entrenched behavioral issues uh, and we cannot just put a timeline to it sometimes. Unfortunately, and no, unfortunately we asked to a three-year project a five-year project, and even if a 10-year project, you just can't tell. And so uh, one of the, 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 the features that we built at CMMB is that, you know what, we are going to stick it out, right? We're going to stay. We don't know how long. We come in a community. We want to transform the indicators before we leave. It's not a five-year commitment. It's not a 10-year commitment. It's a really an impact commitment. So uh, some of the, the, the comments that you would hear from communities where we work, they say, uh, you know, CMMB goes where no one else goes. In South Sudan, for example, I've been in a car to go to a community that we support that had no road. Like we made the road in that car going to that community. Everyone else is going by foot or by bicycle. Um, or some of the, just touching on some of the hardest issues. In Kenya, for example, uh, there was a time after we built, we helped build a community health system, a network of 350 trained community health volunteers, political, a new governor, governor came and had political uh, ambitions or political agendas and changed the whole cohort. So we had to say, look, this is not a personal issue. This is far, far bigger than a term, a, a governor's term. So we really stuck to the issue until we resolved that. Um, another comment is that when others leave, CMMB stay. In Haiti, for example, look, this is a hard situation. A lot of organizations have left. And no one is, you know, they, they, they shouldn't be blamed because there is a lot of risk. And But because of commitment, we say, we're going to stick it out. We're going to stay. Uh, our country director, for example, is a you know a uh, dual national, Haitian and American. She's the only person we have had to take remove from from the country, but operations are still going on in the face of adversity. So I think um, trust, really walking the talk on trust, and walking the talk on commitment, because only through those that you are really able to build systems and build local capacity. 
All right. Thank you so much, Shombo. I, and Claire, that was very insightful. And, and interesting just to add on, and I think you both touched on the aspect of trust. And, and, and I think trust is key for us to have uh, communities that have a buy-in and that we can easily work together with. And maybe one of the other uh, solutions that I've noticed the organization uses really, and I've used it as well, is uh, uh, taking interest in these communities uh, and, and being able to communicate information in a complete manner and way. And most of us as organizations, I think we have a tendency of sharing pretty complete information and maybe we might have material motives towards our intervention towards communities. So comprehensive information is very important as we share our approaches, we need to share what we're going to do there and how we're going to work around with them and how they'll benefit at the end of the day. And I think that is important. I think the other point that Shobo uh, mentioned as well is, is allowing communities uh, to tell us or inform us how best they want to be saved and to be helped. I think again, as organization, I think as, as, even as individuals, individuals, we have an approach of going in these communities and thinking as if the solution that we are coming with in different localities might even work in that. We know as those people have their own understanding on the problem that is on the ground and how best to solve it. Basically, they do have the solutions themselves. And moving on to uh, to the aspect of uh, uh, how uh, this community-centered approach can be achieved these days is the fact that our component of community system threatening and these community system training supports really, they help to develop uh, uh, informed decisions uh, in terms of the communities making the informed decisions, having strong and coordinated communities, as well as the development of these community-led and community-based organization groups and structures in order to advance the aspect of health equity. And centered to this all is that uh, this community, this uh, 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 community system training is really aimed at uh, empowering these communities to effectively address their own health, uh, uh, health and the developmental challenges that they face in their communities. And this should be done or can be done through collaborative efforts as well as improved coordination, as well as uh, sustainable initiatives. Now. Moving to you, Yombo, uh, under this question, how can community health systems be strengthened toward resilience and long-term impact? Well, that's a million dollar question, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I think CHW systems can be strengthened toward impact uh, when we effectively address the challenges that plague them. And, and here I'll name just six of them. Um, one of them is what I termed exploitation, a little provocatively. Uh, for far too long, we have wished for community health, you know, community health worker uh, task to be achieved free uh, out of volunteers. And uh, I can ask around the, this, uh, this screen, how many of us have volunteered this year, how many hours? But it takes uh, many hours of a community health volunteers time to do the work that we expect them to do for free. And we are asking these tasks of the people who are the most vulnerable. Most of them are women and they are trying to live by. And we go around trying to promote that it has to be free. I think that is exploitation. That's got to change. We have to pay them. Luckily, I think this is a this is now a trend that even national you know, the national governments are adopting policies to pay community health workers. The second problem, Steve, is verticality. Right now, you can, if you go into countries, the Global Fund is still running vertical programs. Like malaria is a problem, I agree, but it should not be addressed vertically. You can see community health workers who are just tasked, they're trained, equipped, and deployed to take care of malaria. That is, health is a holistic problem. It has to be addressed holistically. Um, estimation is another problem. What do I mean by estimation? We still go around estimating the number of babies that we have in a community that we're trying to protect. We are estimating the number of pregnant women that we need to get to antenatal care. Why are we doing this? We can count a, 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 
a shepherd will count their cows. They know how many cows they have. And as people, as global health practitioners, we do not know how many pregnant women we are trying to protect. I think that is ridiculous, excuse my term. We need to start doing real catchment mapping. And this is what CMMB is doing. If we are in a community, we map every household, we count the people, we follow them, because that's the only way you can see your impact. Uh, the fourth problem is externality, which is what I mentioned earlier, putting community back in community health worker problems, uh, problem, uh, community health worker programs. Uh, if I'm sitting here in New York and leading on community health workers, that is ridiculous again, because the community members, they know, they have the resources, they have the capacity to lead that program. And they have to be at the, at the forefront. Uh, it's not because we fund that we have to lead. The fifth problem is disempowerment. As a community health worker, if most community health workers feel disempowered because they are put in a position that they're not equipped for. I am supposed to take care of 100 households, but reaching them, I'm, I have to do it by foot. I don't have a bicycle. I don't have the proper tools to even collect the data when I treat a child so that the data is clean and that we can use for decision making. I am not equipped, not tooled properly because somehow we think that community health worker program have to be cheap. That is disempowerment. If you empower community health workers fully, they will do a great job. And finally, just the overall inadequacy of community health work assistance. If your community problem is the health problem is non-communicable diseases, you have to focus your program, design your program to address NCDs, not malaria. On the other hand, if your problem is really malaria, when 50% of your hospital consultations is malaria, then you got to focus your, your uh, system to address that at the community level. So these are the, 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 the problems and how I would resolve them. All right. Thank you so much, Shobo. That was amazing. And uh, just to add on and on the, uh, what you said, I think, think it's interesting that you mentioned all those components. And also that starts with the issue of how community health workers are exploited by not basically being certified and you know they do much of the work and comprehensively looking at how we strengthen this i think there is so much to be done and we can do to support each and everyone who's on the call even uh, others who are not on the call how best we can support as well as improve uh, these uh, community health systems so that they can be more resilient and as well as uh, achieve the long-term impact. Uh, well, uh, we'll check if we have any questions uh, in the in the chat. Uh, do we have any questions? Just check it through if we have any questions. We do have a few questions, Stephen. Um, I'm happy to read them out. We have a, a few in the chat um, as well as on our Q&A. So, um, how about I start with um, Philippa? I hope I've pronounced that correctly. My apologies if I didn't. Um, have there been steps taken towards collaborating with traditional healers as part of a community approach, particularly regarding referrals to hospitals or clinics? Are there any examples? How about we start there? Okay. Uh, did we get the question? Claire or Yobo, anyone can uh, jump on that question? I can take um, a, a I can take a stab. I um this is a this is a great question. I think um my experience in Senegal was with uh, community aunts. They are not they're not necessarily local uh, traditional uh, healers but they are revered and respected as our aunts, our mothers, our, you know, uh, sisters. And uh, Senegal for a long time, and maybe even now still relies on, on in a, kind of a, a cadre of old grandmas 
to be uh, supporting the antenatal or the safe motherhood uh, program in uh, at the community level, because the saying goes that only the the auntie in the community will tell you will will know age even when they haven't either they don't know or they don't want to tell you and so we can't be talking about early antenatal care uh sending a male community health volunteer at the household when the auntie is is in the household and can tell you more about that uh but i don't know i what i don't know about claire in terms of using um yeah it's a great question has been uh steps towards collaboration with traditional healers Um, I've seen it in Congo and, and I've seen it in New York. Um, I think, think when we talk about community health, have important roles in the community and people trust them and express effort to, to reach out to traditional healers. that they might be already in uh, some of these roles. Um, makes me think uh, that need to be provided by um, doctors, for example. Um, nurses in some cases and identify them and then train them on basic um, because and the really key pieces to know um, when to refer um, switch Even that they have, even when they have administered their traditional kind of uh, remedies in terms of medicine, they still need to be referring these women as well as any other to the hospitals and the clinic to be to go and uh, be seen there rather than just discouraging them after seeing them at their uh, uh, place of administering the care in terms of their traditional uh, touches or or anything like that. Thanks so much for those responses, Claire and Yambo and Stephen. Um, you know, as Stephen, as you said, so much of that builds on what you each shared throughout this conversation of, of trust, really, at that cornerstone. Um, and I think one other question we've had come in uh, touches on another piece that you've talked about, really, around the funding um, as a critical piece that both incorporates trust, um, trust from the donor community and, and within um, our programs, but this question from Colin is, what efforts can you think of to shift funding and granting structures in the long term to promote these longer scales? Um, and, and I'll add to that, you know, also this community-based approach that allows for more trust um, and trust building um, onto that. So um, over to whoever would like to take it. All right, thank you so much. Anyone, <laughs> just go for it. Um, All right, I can go for it. Oh, sorry, Yango, are you? No, go for it first, Claire. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it later. Within the context of um, the local public health department in the United States, I think, um, you know, funding is allocated by uh, state and um, and local budgets. So having the local representatives understand and champion this at the key moments when the budget is being defended, um, I, I think would go 
really far to ensuring that there's uh, continual funding for programs that promote community approaches. Um, for community health workers in Tompkins County, that looked like getting a uh, a civil service position for the community health workers, which comes with its own challenges, but ensures that this is a position that um, that can be uh, that can be included year after year in um, and and slowly becomes uh, standardized in public health uh, infrastructure. All right, we seem to be running out of time. Uh, I don't know if uh, how many want to still have room for one more response from you boy if he has anything before Absolutely. we move Absolutely, yes. Definitely. Yambo, do you have anything to add? Yeah, quickly, I was just going to say uh, absolutely. At a global level and at the, the local level. So at a global level, you can definitely see trends and shifts uh, in global health advocacy towards uh, this donor mindset shift. Uh, I was at a, a, a conference just last last year in uh, in DC uh, with um, I think international care ministries where don donors were there and they explained from their point of view why they 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 expect what they expect but then from a programmatic standpoint what we need to kind of uh, bring them along so that they can understand and change their their funding format so I think there is a shift because the understanding is global that until we change that funding uh, structure, we're not gonna be able to do uh, some, you know, true community-centered approaches that have impact. At the local level, I think as we, Global Health Corps and CMMB and other organizations continue to do this work and demonstrate the impact of what we do and built in you know, key positions. For example, in our model, we have a champs coordinator position that kind of comes in now, it's new, but you know, local local MOH are absorbing these positions because they understand that you cannot drive a community-centered approach without you know the resource, the, the the human resource for it. So I think it is changing at both global level and local levels. All right, great. Thank you so much, Shombo. Uh, that was great. Um, we'll quickly move. Uh, and before uh, we close this, I want to do just a one lightning round questions for all of uh, the, course, the two panelists that we have had. Uh, that's Claire and Yombo. And from your point of view, Claire and Yombo, what does the future of community centered interventions to public health outcomes look like? And we'll start with uh, our lady, Claire, to, to go through first. Then your boy, then I'll come in as well before I hand it over to Hannah. Thank you. Uh, so this is my prediction. I would say that community-centered interventions are a necessity, but they're by no means an inevitability. We, as we've discussed, we need to advocate for them. And communicable disease pandemics like COVID provide a great opportunity for generating evidence on the value of community approaches. So we need convincing data on their efficacy and communicating that well to local authorities, elected representatives, donors, so they understand value and champion community health and they ensure that resources are allocated to these interventions. Uh, you know, uh, women are braver than men. So Claire is brave to make a prediction. But my prediction is going to be to channel along the, the Matrix. Some of you have seen the the movie, The Matrix. I, I feel like uh, I need to channel that and say, uh, if as community, uh, global health uh, practitioners, if we take the blue pill, I think we are going to stay in the reality. We are going to continue programming as it is. Uh, and, um, and nothing, not much will change. So it is up to all of us here, including the donor community, including the local practitioners. But if we go for the red pill, if we take the red pill, then we are brave enough to 
walk the talk on trust, right? That is again, from the donor's perspective and the practitioner perspective, because sometimes we also have the flexibility of the money, but the design of our community center approaches are not really uh, fully taking everything into account. I think in that case, we will see that 10, 20, 30 years from now, we'll be looking at communities that are resilient in their capacity to achieve and sustain health and well-being. All right, thank you. I'll come through um, how it looks like to me. Uh, it seems to be very promising, first of all. And I, I say so because of, um, I think one of the uh, solutions to the challenges that have been faced in the community that approach uh, is talking about these issues. And this is a platform that Global Health Core set up right now to discuss and to uh, go through the challenges and opportunities that lie in there. I think that is an, a step forward in, in order to improve and make sure that this convincing that approach has its fruits that are uh, being achieved at the end of the day. So it's promising to me. And as well as the research part as well, I, I think there is more uh, uh, talk around it and the research as well in how uh, based this approach achieves uh, this resilience as well as sustainability in terms of uh, intervention that we play forward. And all in all, I think with collaboration, and just like you always say, that as well, if we are intentional about this as a community, as individuals, I think the future will be very bright for community led approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but this has really been phenomenal and so insightful. Thank you, Claire, Yambo, Stephen, for sharing your insights and your experiences. Um, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, just as a reminder, we will send out the recording uh, to everyone who attended, and we'll also be posting it on GHC Connect for the GHC community. Thank you again for joining. We wish you um, healthy, wonderful days uh, to everyone. Um, and please stay tuned for our future Shift Happens series. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Thank Anna. You. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for moderating. Bye.